want to introduce John Cavana. John has been part of the peace movement all of these years. He is the director uh, of IPS, the Institute for Policy Studies, uh, which I think of as perhaps the think tank where thinking actually goes on. He has been uh, the director since 1998 and other positions prior. He is the co-author of at least 10 books, including Development Redefined, How the Market Met Its Match. John Cavana. Thank you so much, David, and it's great to follow um, one of my heroes, Medea Benjamin. Uh, this room actually, for those of you watching online, is full of heroes, and it's a good moment to lift them up, and also the heroes around the world that we've been hearing from and hearing about. But I do think we should pause just for a second to particularly thank uh, Jody Evans and Medea Benjamin, who have been leading for well over a decade in this fight uh, with courage, uh, with truth, and with love, and we're all indebted to you. Um, as David said, my organization, the Institute for Policy Studies, is truly proud to participate in this vital tribunal. Um, I want to just, in, in my brief time here, remind us all about two big lies that were at the center of the war. First, I want to say something about one of the biggest lies that paved the way for the US war on Iraq, a blatant lie about the projected costs of that war. In the lead up to the war, the Bush administration, many people here remember this, didn't want to say anything about the likely costs of this war, either financial or human. Their much repeated line was, it will be over quickly with minimal costs. Then a great controversy erupted in September 2002 when one of them did attempt an estimate. When Bush economic advisor Lawrence Lindsay estimated, this was a full seven months before the US unleashed the missiles of war, he estimated that its costs might go as high as $200 billion. Other parts of the Bush administration quickly said that this was too high. One said that the estimate was baloney. That was from Rumsfeld. Quickly, a Bush spokesman downgraded the pre-war estimate to 50 to 60 billion, and they fired Lindsay. Well, fast forward a few years. Prominent economists, Joseph Stiglitz and Linda Bilmes, one of them the holder of a Nobel Prize, have now calculated, and Jody started with the whole tribunal with this figure, but have calculated that the eventual total cost of US wars in Iraq and Afghanistan will end up at over $5 trillion, which is remarkably over 25 times the original estimate of the guy who was fired, Lawrence Lindsay, and it's over 100 times greater than what the rest of the Bush team was saying before the war. Much of this cost is, sadly, from the long-term health costs that plague many veterans their entire lives, brain injuries and brain trauma, which over 100,000 veterans suffer from, are particularly costly uh, over the course of a vet's lifetime. But just let that figure sit, if you will, for a moment. Five trillion dollars. That sum could have funded and can fund the full transition of our economy and the Iraqi economy from fossil fuel, militarized, and Wall Street economies to clean energy peaceful Main Street economies. Now, a few words on the second lie. This lie was rooted in a statement about history. The government was assuming that since the United States had ended the draft after the Vietnam War, and hence had ended the fear in every family that one of their own could be selected to fight in a war, they assumed that the public wouldn't care much if the US engaged in a war on the other side of the planet. Well, it turned out that people cared a great deal, both in the United States and overseas. And in 2002 and 2003, we were reminded just how quickly that public can react and mobilize against unjust war. Just as millions of people came together almost overnight as volunteers to support the Bernie campaign in 2015 and 2016, millions joined the mass mobilizations against US war in Iraq. And it was truly a sight 
to behold. All it really took was smart organizing. Groups like Code Pink were dreamed up uh, by, in this case, Jody and Medea and others of you in this room, and went into action. In my case, my, the Institute for Policy Studies, led by my tireless colleague, Phyllis Bennis, joined with several terrific people. And I remember these first meetings. Medea was there, Leslie Kagan, Bill Fletcher. Uh, and in October of 2002, this was soon after George Bush started talking about his desire for war, we sat down and listed all the groups and people who would be devastated by war in this country. Workers, women, environmentalists, veterans, Muslim Americans, local groups, and we called for a meeting in late October 2002 here in Washington. Representatives of 69 groups answered the call, and we launched what became a network of over 1,400 local and national groups, it's been mentioned before, called United for Peace and Justice. It became the nerve center of anti-war organizing, and it helped issue the global call to people of good conscience all over the world that resulted in 12 to 14 million people in over 600 cities standing together on February 15, 2003 in a global day when the world said no to war. Imagine 12 to 14 million people standing up in the face of lies. Let me end by just uh, sharing a few words from a woman I just met with this morning who is in her first week as a new member of the US Congress, Pramila Jayapal. Pramila, many of you know, is a fierce fighter for immigrant rights, for women's rights, for racial justice, for worker rights, for the environment. And she's now in the US Congress. And as we sat there over breakfast this morning, she was remembering the early days of building Code Pink with Jody and Medea. And she asked me simply to share these words with all of you in this room and those watching, um, never lose hope. Together we will build the multiracial coalitions that we will need to defend all people and to win peace and justice. Thank you.